Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to a special edition of APTN National News. Tonight we revisit our coverage of Taiwan. The country has a rich indigenous heritage with 16 different peoples recognized by the state. While their customs and culture differ greatly from indigenous peoples in Canada, many of their struggles will sound familiar. APTN's Tom Fenario had the opportunity to go to Taiwan recently. Here's part one of a two-part series, The People of Formosa. Taiwan is affectionately known as Formosa. Portuguese sailors named it as such in the 16th century when they saw the island. It means beautiful. Smaller than Nova Scotia, it nonetheless is brimming with 23 million inhabitants. The cities here fit the Asian template, pulsing skyscrapers, neon washed markets, constant movement. Much of the west coast is urbanized from the north to the south. But cross over the ring of mountains that divide the country to where they meet the Pacific coast and you'll see why they call it Formosa. <laughs> Here, you'll find a slower pace, as well as many of Taiwan's 500,000 indigenous people. In Taiwan, like, it's so much more appealing to live here on the East Coast just because it's not developed yet. Having spent part of his childhood in the U.S. and Europe, Asan Soro's English skills have landed him a job. He gives tours that explain Amis culture, how they are famous for weaving and fishing, and also how it's been a battle to maintain their heritage. Our family is called the Wu family, which is an interesting fact because, like, once the Chinese came in after World War II, we had to get new names, new sure names. And so everybody went in and, you know, had to draw their last name, so we picked Wu. Sandwiched between Chinese rule in the early 20th century, the Japanese were colonizers here. Relations with them were not any better. Soro's Amis ancestors once staged a rebellion near this spot. After the harvest, you always have to give, like, major cuts to the Japanese. So after a lot of, you know, just being, uh, just being mistreated, basically, they were fed up and they just went into the police, in the police station and beheaded all the, the Japanese policemen. And uh, the uprising is called Ma Sao Sao. And Ma Sao Sao, Sao Sao in our language means light. And uh, why, why it has that name, it's because while we were hiding in the, in the mountains, the Japanese came along and they started uh, burning all the houses and uh, the stock, the grain stock. Well, the chiefs who led the uprising down, were gruesomely executed. Mao Sao Sao was one of the many indigenous-led battles that took place here in the 20th century. And while there's no doubt that relations with settlers are better today, many issues still remain. Now everybody who wants to retire and stuff is starting to move here. So that's what's driving the land value up and also yeah, makes us, and uh, ultimately makes us lose our land. Further south down the coast, Arigüe is performing a ceremony. Before leading a group through the mountain, he must first speak to his ancestors and ask for protection. Arigüe has learned much about his Pinyu Mayan culture from his elders. He is well versed in wild plants growing in his territory. Lately, he's also discovered a lot about agriculture, but in a bad way. Arigüe says many people in his community make a living renting their land to ethnic Chinese, known here as Han, who then grow crops in a way that is detrimental for the environment. Etienne Polush is a niece. He also happens to be the minister of the Council of Indigenous Peoples, the government body that deals with indigenous affairs. At a press conference, he explains that about 7% of Taiwan is considered reserved land for indigenous tribes. But about half of that is privately owned, meaning it can be sold. 
In 2015, we have uh, the Parliament have revised the Indigenous Basic Law, which enabled the Indigenous communities to be um, to um, to chase the uh, autonomy of themselves. But uh, this deal is still in drafting. The ministry, known as CIP for short, hopes to have an Indigenous Autonomy Bill drafted before the end of 2017. This will be the fifth draft of the bill to be brought to legislature in the last 12 years. Even if it does pass, not everyone is convinced that it will work. Masako Makalin, a woman's youth leader in the Piniuman community of Kasavakan, says drawing up territory isn't going to be easy. Indigenous people in Taiwan, they will fight against, and against each other because when we draw up the land, there will be some similarity between each other and they will fight. Tohima Togal is a Piniumayan journalist and activist. She equates having autonomy to trying to run before you can walk. But now we are like looking at the final goal. Forget that between the final goal, we still have this huge gap between ourselves. It's not about the government or about like the other actors or the other stakeholders. It's all about ourselves. The gap, she says, is the common struggle to keep indigenous languages and culture alive amongst the onslaught of Han culture and people. People don't want us to think for ourselves. They want us to obey, still like, still until today. So that will be, I think that will be the most difficult thing that for our people to be confident enough, brave enough to say, I don't need your permission. The race to preserve indigenous languages and culture here is an urgent one. Tomorrow, APTN News will look at what regular folks and the powers that be are doing to keep indigenous culture strong. So if and when autonomy is achieved, it won't be for naught. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Taiwan. Time for a quick break and then we'll have part two of Tom Fenario's People of Formosa series. From the beginning, APTN National News and APTN Investigates made a commitment to journalistic excellence. We were the first Aboriginal network in the world. Our work has been recognized by respected agencies worldwide. In May 2016, we were recognized with awards from the Canadian Association of Journalists. In October, APTN's Paul Barnsley was presented with the JHR Lifetime Achievement Award in Human Rights Reporting. This past January, APTN accepted an ECPAD Canada Media Award. And most recently in May, APTN was honored with the coveted Canadian Association of Journalists Charles Burry Award in recognition of significant contribution to Canadian journalism. APTN would like to thank you, our viewers, and reaffirm our commitment to you. APTN National News and APTN Investigates, uncovering the stories that others won't. Welcome back. From Europeans in the 17th century to Japanese and Chinese in more recent times, the indigenous peoples of Taiwan have been subject to an unceasing wave of colonialism. Yet they've still maintained their culture and languages. But how much longer can they persevere? Tom Fenario went to Taiwan to find out. Here's the second part of his series, The People of Formosa. <laughs> Bayan man is proclaiming victory. A traditional ceremony, this prideful performance usually occurs after a battle is won. But in this instance, it's a part of the opening ceremonies of the 2017 International Austronesian Conference. The gathering brings together indigenous people from Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as one Abenaki from the Odenak First Nation in Quebec. As I've gone around the world over the uh, these past 15 years, meeting with uh, other indigenous peoples in various situations. What is astounding is the similar, similarity of our experiences. I also want to acknowledge that I am on uh, indigenous territory. As CEO of APTN, Jean LaRose was invited here to speak on a media panel. One issue raised that struck a chord with him, the race to save Taiwan's indigenous languages from extinction. 
while they haven't had a residential school experience per se, they have been integrated and forced into a mainstream education system that is not at all friendly to their languages. And most of them have, are, have communities that have as few language speakers as we do in Canada. Taiwan has a population of about 23 million and growing on an island smaller than Nova Scotia. The 16 recognized indigenous tribes make up 2.3% of the population, about 530,000 people. The risk of being assimilated into larger Chinese culture is very real. The longer we wait to really save our language, the more people move to urban area, the, 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 the more indigenous peoples are connected with modernity. They, they, of course, during this course of time, they change. And I think the challenge is how do we hold on to what we used to be, the tradition, the language. Yeda Palamo is the CEO of the foundation that runs Taiwan Indigenous Television, known as TITV. Since 2005, they've been producing news and award-winning programming in indigenous languages and recently launched a radio station. While Palama is clearly proud of their work, she says it's getting harder to staff her programs with language speakers. How do we maintain our identity as an ethnic media if we do not know enough about ourselves? There appears to be some help on the way. Itzhen Palush is the minister of the Council of Indigenous Peoples, the arm of the government that deals with indigenous issues. Palush, who is a part of the Amis tribe, says that a recently passed law will promote indigenous languages. We have been uh, dedicating to the, to the promoting of um, this, uh, this bill of the indigenous language development for 12 years, and it was finally passed in the legislature this year. And it is very important that in this bill, the indigenous languages are confirmed to be the national languages of Taiwan. The act will ask townships with significant indigenous populations to write all official documentation in their language, as well as Chinese, including road signs. The government also stepped up to help fund language centers like this one. These children are singing in the PDU Mayan language. While this is certainly encouraging, it might not be enough. People here say the language could be extinct in 20 to 30 years. Tohima Tugal is a Pinyu Mayan journalist and activist. She says the government needs to cut red tape that gets in the way of language development. One example she gives, her community of Casavacan would like a traditional daycare where elders take care of kids and speak the language to them. But they can't because the elders need childcare licenses to work at a daycare. Either lose the regulation or try to find a way so our elders, our own people, can take care of our own children and to have this environment for them to talk our languages on a daily life basis. Togal also says government regulations interfere with other cultural practices, like hunting. In the law, they say that indigenous peoples are allowed to hunt only for ceremonies, only for certain occasions. So we have, we have to apply for it. So before we go hunting, we have to fill up application and tell them, okay, how many deers we will get, how many pigs we will get, but who knows? Because it's not something that we will go for like, okay, five deers, then five deers. It's something given by our ancestors. Regulations aside, the Pinyu Mayan community of Casavacan is doing its best to take language and culture preservation into its own hands. Hereditary chief Haku Dumalades picked up carving at the age of 48 in order to promote culture. Now his carvings depicting everyday Pinyu Mayan life and legends decorate the village. <laughs> With language revitalization and youth taking back traditional hunting practices, it would appear that many here want to follow their ancestors. What really struck me here, as is striking us in Canada now, is the encouragement and the positive sense that a lot of young people have that it can be recaptured.
The bayan ceremony is calling the animals to the guns of the men. In essence, they're asking for a bountiful hunt. But back then, instead of asking for permits from the government, they were requesting guidance from their ancestors. Now more than ever, it would appear that the indigenous peoples of Formosa will continue to take that approach. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Taiwan. Coming up after the break, we'll speak with Tom Fenario about his trip to Taiwan and with APTN CEO John LaRose, who was invited to speak on a media panel in Taiwan. Stay with us. From the beginning, APTN National News and APTN Investigates made a commitment to journalistic excellence. We were the first Aboriginal network in the world. Our work has been recognized by respected agencies worldwide. In May 2016, we were recognized with awards from the Canadian Association of Journalists. In October, APTN's Paul Barnsley was presented with the JHR Lifetime Achievement Award in Human Rights Reporting. This past January, APTN accepted an ECPAD Canada Media Award. And most recently in May, APTN was honored with the coveted Canadian Association of Journalists Charles Burry Award in recognition of significant contribution to Canadian journalism. APTN would like to thank you, our viewers, and reaffirm our commitment to you. APTN National News and APTN Investigates, uncovering the stories that others won't. Welcome back. APTN News video journalist Tom Fenario recently spent a week in Taiwan visiting indigenous communities there. His two-part series, The People of Formosa, explores the beauty of their land and culture as well as the challenges they face. He joins us from Montreal. Tom, thanks for taking the time to join us here. Thanks for having me, Dennis. Tell us a little bit about the indigenous peoples of Taiwan. Well, much like the indigenous peoples of Canada, uh, there are a very diverse peoples, and I wouldn't uh, pretend to be able to describe them all to you in a single paragraph, but um, a complete overview, I guess I would say. There are 16 different recognized uh, tribes, as they call them there. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other ones that are aiming to be recognized at some point in the future. So uh, it might sound familiar to uh, indigenous folks here, but lots of... Uh, interpolitics and identity politics going on there as well. I would say in terms of culture, um, they, uh, what really struck me is uh, lots of beautiful uh, chanting and ceremonial songs, um, but uh, more, more of a choir, I find, to what, the way they sing and their arts. Um, but much like indigenous peoples everywhere, uh, lots of pride in their culture, lots of pride in their practices, and uh, yeah, some challenges as well. What were some of the similarities you noticed in Taiwan compared to here? Um, I would say definitely uh, they, uh, there's, a, there's a struggle for their, um, to keep their languages alive. There's um, a, a com constant struggle to get out from underneath uh, colonialism and, uh, and sort of like a, a more larger culture that's overwhelming them. Um, uh, but there's also um, a, a sense of... Um, a sense of willing to fight for what they believe in. Um, one thing that struck me, I think maybe because I work in Mohawk territory, so I, I work with a lot of Mohawks, but th there's a real history of, of standing up and fighting for the rights, sometimes in armed resistance there. That not, I don't think it's, um, you won't necessarily get from them immediately because they're, they're very, from whom I met, they're very kind and, and outgoing people, but uh, it sounds like if things get ugly, they know how to, they know how to, they know how to fight for what's right. Tom, were there any interesting aspects of indigenous life there you weren't able to include in your stories? Um, I would say one thing that I didn't get a chance to touch on very much is that um, Taiwan itself is a very, uh, even the people who are kind of colonizing the indigenous peoples have another layer of colonization above them in the sense that um, there's the uh, People's Republic of China that says they, uh, Taiwan is a part of them but the people who, the government of Taiwan says they do not belong to China, that they are their own proper government, but Taiwan is not actually recognized by the United Nations as its own country. So there's this whole other layer of um, Taiwan independence, and it was interesting for me to ask indigenous peoples there 
hey, how do you feel about Taiwan? Is it an independent country? Does it just belong to China? And uh, it, it, it's interesting for, uh, I got met many different responses about how would it be more advantageous if Taiwan was not considered part of China? Uh, does it really matter? And um, I guess a lot of the, a lot of that I got was a bit of a shrug response to people saying, well, colonizers are colonizers. What's important is that we look after our own and we take after our own. And uh, I thought that was really neat. Sorry, my earpiece keeps slipping out. <laughs> no problem, Tom. I appreciate uh, your work over there. It was some beautiful scenery and nice to see, uh, get a glimpse into their cultures. You're a lucky guy to get to go over and spend that time there. And we appreciate you taking the time to tell us about it here today. It was a real privilege. Thanks for having me, Dennis. As you saw in Tom's series, APTN CEO was invited to Taiwan for the event. Jean LaRose shared his perspective on the conference theme of cultural heritage and community empowerment. Mr. LaRose joins me in studio now. Jean, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, APTN is part of a global community of broadcasters known as WITBIN, the World Indigenous Television Broadcasters Network, which Taiwan is also a part of through TITV. Uh, why is it important for broadcasters like TITV and APTN to exist? I think they're, we're the only voice that our people have truly to tell their stories to themselves and to the rest of the world. So it's very important from that perspective to have broadcasters such as us be the face and the voice of all of these communities and tell those stories around the world. Yeah, I had the pleasure of uh, spending about 10 days over in Taiwan. What were some of the things that stick out in your mind from that experience? Some of the key things were the, uh, the dynamic uh, enthusiasm that young people over there have to reclaim their languages, their history, their cultures, and to a certain part, reestablish themselves on the land. They've been dispossessed in Taiwan over centuries of uh, colonial occupation. Uh, they have no land left, as opposed to us here who have these small parcels here and there called reserves. So to see the degree to which young people have determined that they would rebuild their communities, rebuild their societies, and reconnect them to their languages and cultures were definitely some of the stronger highlights. A uh, great opportunity for us to highlight uh, what's going on there and for you to take our experience over to them as well. So uh, appreciate you taking the time to share some of your experience with us here today. Well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. And that's all the time we have for tonight. Thanks for tuning in to this special edition of APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night.